Okay, but I'm going to get us started and welcome everybody to the second annual pitch competition co-sponsored by the Program and Practical Policy Engagement here at the Ford School in our Graduate Career Services Office. Um, I'm Liz Gerber. I'm the director of P3E. Um, and uh, I see lots of people who have helped make this event happen. Um, I apologize in advance if you are one of those people and I miss you, but I'd like to thank the P3E staff, Miriam Nagarin and Cindy Bank, the GCS staff, I see Jennifer, I see Peter, I think I see Claire. Um, sorry if I've missed anyone. Um, it took a lot of people to bring us all together here um, and um, for a really exciting event. I'd also like to thank our good friends and sponsors, Phil and Kathy Power, who are serving for the second year as judges. Um, I will hand it over in a moment to Peter, who will give a proper introduction to all of the judges, but um, just want to recognize Phil and Kathy for their generosity in supporting the Ford School's Engage Learning. Um, we um, are all very grateful, and this kind of event allows us to sort of see all the great Engage Learning internship experiences you guys are all having. So um, could everybody please join me in thanking the amazing staff who's helped bring us together. <laughs> You did not come here to listen to me. You came here to listen to Peter. No, right. <laughs> Peter um, Vasher um, really, and Cindy Bank really sort of uh, led uh, this, uh, the work in organizing this. And I'm going to hand it over to Peter to get us going. Thanks. All right. Yeah, you maybe came to hear me very briefly. Uh, and then we'll kick it to our students. Uh, but thank you for coming to our second annual uh, policy pitch competition, very excited about that. Uh, and we have a very full room, which is fantastic. Uh, but we appreciate the opportunity to collaborate with our friends in P3E. And thank you to our staff uh, for working hard to make this happen. Jennifer, Claire, Casey, Shiu, and Elizabeth uh, for being here and supporting the event today. Uh, thank you to our judges, who I'll introduce here shortly. Uh, and then also thank you to our student presenters. Uh, so thank you for having the courage and the confidence to come up and deliver your pitches today. So if we could give them a hand at the outset. All right, so our judge is right up here. Uh, but we have Kathy Power of the Power Foundation, and she is also a community volunteer with such organizations as Planned Parenthood and the Humane Society of Huron Valley. If you could give Kathy a hand. We have Phil Power, who is a BA from the University of Michigan, 1960, a former newspaper publisher, and served on the U of M Board of Regents from 1987 to 1999. He is a member of the Ford School Committee as well. He was the owner of Hometown Communications Network, an award-winning group of 64 community newspapers in Michigan and the Upper Midwest. Phil founded the Center for Michigan in 2006, a think and do tank that encourages greater understanding and involvement and policy issues among Michigan citizens. He also helped found the Corporation for a Skilled Workforce and served as Vice Chairman of the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. So I can give Phil a thank you. <laughs> Next up we have Alushula Samuel. He is a Division Administrator for Michigan Medicine and also the Chair of the Ford School Alumni Board. Uh, Alusha helps lead division finances, human resources, operations, research administration, and faculty affairs for Michigan Medicine. Prior to this, he was a business manager over at Beaumont Health in Royal Oak, where he helped lead the integration and strategic planning for women's and children's services across the organization's eight hospitals. He's also been instrumental in leading the reunion that's coming up in a couple weeks here at the Ford School. So thank you, Alusha. We have Nikki Sundstrom. She's responsible for developing innovative solutions to strategically leverage and advance interactive communications at the University of Michigan. She leads the Social Communications Office and Strategic Oversight of the President's Public Engagement and Impact Initiative. 
These efforts, along with the university's social integrity project, each aim to ensure that all online communications provide additional value to university stakeholders while mitigating institutional risk, elevating brand perception, and educating users of all ages and around the globe of the lasting impact of these critical tools. And prior to the University of Michigan, uh, she worked developing and coordinating the state of Michigan's so statewide social media footprint. So thank you for being here. And last but not least, we have John Zeraldo, who's the president of Commonwealth Consulting and former vice president of program and strategy at the Skillman Foundation, uh, where he led their vision and strategy and supported the development of program team members. He brings significant experience from the philanthropic and nonprofit sectors, uh, most recently serving as a P VP at Skillman, a senior program officer at the William Davidson Foundation, and also as president and CEO of Lighthouse in Oakland County. He also was the director of programs at the Guidance Center and a founding executive director of the Thompson McCauley Foundation. Uh, John holds a BA in philosophy from Detroit's Sacred Heart Seminary and an MPA from the Ford School of Public Policy here at the University of Michigan. John's also a lifelong Detroiter and diehard Red Wings, Tigers, and Lions fan, <laughs> which I appreciate. All right, I know you've heard enough from me and we will get started, but just a couple housekeeping uh, logistics on the evening. So we have 11 presenters here today delivering their pitchers. And throughout the evening, uh, I'll be popping in to give a quick fun fact to allow our judges time to recoup their thoughts. So you'll hear from me a couple times. Uh, but these uh, fun facts will be focused on internships, career development, and other fun things about <laughs> career aspirations. And for those in the audience, I actually have pulled some data that you shared with us a couple weeks ago. So you may hear something that you have shared in your first couple weeks of school here at Ford. But without further ado, we welcome our first pitch presenter, Monica. Hi everyone, and thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, my name is Monica Anderson, and before I came to grad school, I worked for about three years as a case manager, um, working with young adults who suffered serious mental illness. Um, I absolutely loved the work. I loved the interpersonal work. I loved doing social work. Um, but over time, I was increasingly frustrated with some of the systems that social work exists within, um, and some of the disconnect that I was seeing between who is making mental health policy, who is implementing it, and who is receiving these services. Um, and I really wanted to do something about it, but I couldn't figure out what the right career path was. Um, unbeknownst to me at the time, dual degrees exist. Um, and I am now a second year dual degree student with the School of Social Work as well. When I was looking for an internship last year, um, I was really thinking about agencies that inspire me and that I really like. I ended up cold emailing the executive director of the New York City office of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, also known as NAMI. Um, NAMI is the largest grassroots mental health organization in the country. Um, they are unique in that they serve not only those living with mental illness, but also their family and their loved ones. Um, to my shock, the executive director responded to me also um, and said that they wanted to have a little bit more focus in public policy and that they might have a spot for me. Um, NAMI New York City has a full-time staff of 12 people, a budget of just over a million dollars, and they reached 13,000 people last year. They're an incredible office to see what they can do. The beauty of working in such a small office also um, was I got to work all summer with, directly with the manager of public policy and advocacy. Um, I got to really help shape what our priorities are what we wanted to be pushing, what we wanted to be working on. Um, I did everything from breaking down the data of who is using our services to researching legislation to um, helping organize a rally to help save a hospital that was at threat of closing. Um, one of my biggest projects though and what I'm really very proud of is from start to finish I researched, wrote, created and delivered an entire campaign plan that NAMI NYC is still using in order to um, pursue the passage of a bill that is currently stuck in committee in New York. The bill would require um, 
all teachers in New York to receive training in mental health, eating disorders, and behavioral disorders. Um, and considering 50% of all mental illness shows signs by the age of 14, this is super important info for teachers to have. Um, all of my work came together in my last week of my internship when we did what we called an advocacy week. My supervisor and I traveled throughout New York City. We hit three of the five boroughs. We met with almost a dozen elected officials. We talked to them, we told them what NAMI does. We gave them statistics about how many of their specific constituents had used our services. We pitched this education bill to them, asked for their support. And in general, we built relationships with the elected officials so that we could keep pursuing good mental health policy. Um, the New York legislature is not back in session until January. I wish I had the vacation of New York legislatures. Um, so I'll see what happens with that education bill then. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing if it can finally move out of committee. Um, in the meantime, I'm not sure what I'll do after I graduate. I kind of like the unknown also. Um, one thing I did learn this summer which surprised me is that I really don't like New York City. Um, so I probably won't end up there. But what I do know is I want to keep doing work like this. I want to keep advocating and talking about mental health and really speaking on behalf of organizations that I believe in, such as NAMI. Thank you so much. All right. And we now welcome Carl. Hi. Three years ago, my wife and I bought the four-unit apartment building where we were living. Uh, as part of our commitment to make our building affordable for our low-income tenants, we participated in a home energy weatherization program. This means we improved our building's energy efficiency in order to save our tenants money on their electric bills. This experience sparked my ex interest in energy policy as I enrolled at the Ford School. Nevertheless, last year I really struggled to narrow down my internship search. I'm a generalist, so I like a lot of things. In fact, when I met with Jennifer from Career Services and she asked me what I wanted to get out of this experience, the best answer I could give was, I want to solve really big problems. I landed an internship with the Michigan Energy Office in the Department of Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy. The Energy Office acts as a bridge between federal and state grant programs and local stakeholders. And they work on projects that promote clean energy and reduce energy waste. I worked on a series of pilot programs in three communities that combine solar energy credits with home weatherization programs for low-income families. Our program had three main goals. We wanted to reduce electricity usage, reduce energy burdens for these families, and improve their home health environment. And this program fit me perfectly. I got to work on two really big pro problems, affordable housing and climate change. And it jump-started my experience in energy policy. Most exciting was the way I was able to see how the skills and knowledge I learned in my first year at the Ford School applied to my internship. I want to give you three examples. First, I was working on uh, an analysis of our Cherryland pilot. And I wanted to answer question number one, where are subscribers using less electricity? Which turns out is a really difficult question because temperature variations from year to year can affect how much a household uses. And we didn't have data on whether they were using air conditioners or portable heaters. So I used an econometric solution from program evaluation. I regressed electricity usage on temperature data and I found, yes, our subscribers were using less electricity. Second, I wanted to solve this data problem, so I wanted to create two new surveys, a pre-survey and a post-survey for future pilot programs. But I'd never created a survey before. So the Energy Office paid for me to attend a survey course. And when I did that, I was able to uh, start conducting uh, these surveys with the participants of our second pilot program. Finally, as we were preparing for this second pilot program, we wanted to try something new with financing. And there was a lot of debate among our stakeholders about whether a short-term or a long-term financing option would be better. I used a lesson from microeconomics about the future value of money to prove that the long-term option was not only better for all of our subscribers, but also better for the electric utility. This experience allowed me to work on two really big problems and helped me plug into the energy policy circuit. It built on my experience as a landlord 
and helped me to apply my skills from the Ford School. But best of all, I was able to directly connect with the people who were benefiting from our program. This survey reminds me that even though I don't know exactly what big problems I want to tackle after the Ford School, it's the people whose everyday lives are impacted by these big policies that need to inform the solutions. Thank you. All right, this is one of those times where I'm going to say a few words. Uh, and actually, it starts out with trivia. So I want to leverage the quant skills in the audience. Uh, so you'll see that we have 11 presenters tonight. And you will see that you have a cheat sheet in front of you if you have a program. But I will, just uh, guesses from the audience in terms of combined mileage, one way for each of these students from Ann Arbor, so adding up from Ann Arbor to Detroit, Ann Arbor to Lansing, for all 11 students, seeing the reach of these 11 presenters and in the Ford School, what that total mileage may be. Do we have any guesses? We, we can go over or under here, We're just a, a number. You don't have to throw out a calculator, but you can use one if you want to. But any, any guesses? Okay, we, John is guessing 50,000, a little less than that. 11,000, all right, a little more than 11. All right, seven, we're going to go with 17 as the closest guess, not Price is Right rules, but the correct answer uh, is 15,527. So, ni nice guess in the row here. And, all right, we're gonna, we are going to bring it, bring it back together, though, uh, and get started with pitch number three, but just two points on distance and, again, in geographic reach of Ford School policy impact. So, at the graduate level... Uh, the furthest international destination was in Dili, Timor-Leste, which is 9,505 miles from Ann Arbor. And we had two students that were there at the Asia Foundation. Um, and then domestically, we had one student in Honolulu, Hawaii, Hawaii Appleseed, which is 4,445 miles from Ann Arbor. So just some geographic trivia, because I like maps if you've been in my office. Um, but thank you for playing Ford Fun Facts Trivia. And after all, come on down. Thank you, Peter. I think I contribute like 9,000 miles because I'm from Indonesia. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Aprisal. I'm a second year MPP student, and I'm from Indonesia. One year ago, September 4, 2018, it is the first day I stepped my feet here at Will Hall. To, to pursue graduate study in public policy. And then 25 days later, a 7.4 earthquake hit central Sulawesi, Indonesia. It followed by two tsunamis and at least three liquefactions. That disaster destroyed central Sulawesi, my hometown. It killed more than 4,500 people. Some of them are my friends, some of them are my neighbors. And at least 173,000 Men, women, children lost their homes. Five months later, I received an email from Direct Relief in Santa Barbara, California, offering an internship as a research intern uh, for a disaster relief program. Direct Relief is a humanitarian aid organization with a mission to improve the life and health of people affected by disaster and poverty without regard to politics, religions, or ability to pay. I was surprised to receive this email because first I was not applying for that position, and <laughs> they actually created a specific position for me. And the second because the disaster relief program was actually in central Sulawesi, in my hometown. My, my internship focused on two main things. The first one, I have to analyze and map the disaster impact after eight months, and how the government policy were being implemented, especially in the area of housing, health, and international aid. 
I travel across central Sulawesi, especially to the remote areas where government support seems unavailable. I talk to the refugees, asking them what's it's needed right now and the most pressing challenges they currently face. And I put all of my findings and document everything and create an interactive map, map using ArcGIS Online for the public to see. The second focus of my internship is to work together with local governments and communities and university to come up with a plan to build healthcare, healthcare infrastructures. I evaluated at least nine budget proposals from local governments. I drafted two grant agreements and two memorandums of understanding. Um, yeah, I found that at the end of my internship, I successfully uh, organized a signing ceremony between Direct Relief, the Vice President itself coming to Indonesia, and also the government of Central Sulawesi province, and also government of Sigi Regency, Palu City, and Donggala Regency, and also University of Muhammadiyah. All of these stakeholders, they finally agree, and I'm so happy to that, they finally agree to build a hospital and eight public health clinics in Central Sulawesi. Um, my takeaway from this internship, well, apart from gaining 20 pounds for the last <laughs> eight weeks, um, probably the new interest that I found toward disaster management policy, and it has grown since I started the semester here in Ann Arbor. Um, today, September 17, 2019, one year later, I am standing here in front of you all, and I'm wearing this uh, traditional hand-woven clothes from Central Sulawesi. I'm celebrating one year studying public policy in the US, and I'm also mourning for the day the disaster happened in my hometown. Central Sulawesi still has a lot of things to do to recover from the disaster, but I would like to take my last 10 seconds to extend my gratitude, especially to Ford School of Public Policy and also Graduate Career Service for bringing me back to my hometown and also for direct relief, <laughs> for most importantly, giving a new, a new hope to Central Sulawesi. Thank you and God bless you all. All right, let's welcome Brooke. So I'm gonna start with a question. Who here has ever written an email? Now raise your hand, yeah, absolutely. All right, probably all of us, right? I think some of you might be writing ones right now. I'm kidding. But um, just think about how integral email has become. We use it to communicate, to apply to jobs, to ask questions. Heck, an email probably invited you to this very event. Yet, if you've never sent an email, it can present a major barrier. So if this were an email, I should have started with a greeting. Maybe, dear judges. Uh, maybe dear audience, but then you have to introduce yourself. So my name is Brooke Bossigal and I'm a senior at the Ford School. Two years ago, my co-founder Aya Kutma and I started an organization called Revive. It was 2017 and we were entering into the sixth year of the Syrian crisis. While Syrian students were pushed out of classrooms and joined what's called the Lost Generation, or a group of students who due to longevity of conflict have been out of school for five plus years, I was sitting in this room in my second year of university, reading about them. Now, I went into policy because unlike other degrees where we would stay in that ivory tower studying the effects of the refugee crisis, Ford students are equipped with the skills to roll up our sleeves and actually start something, to go out and do something and make a change. So we did. Recognizing limitations since we couldn't teach all of fifth grade or pay for everyone's tuition, couldn't even really pay for our own, <laughs> we made it our mission to focus on those smaller things like emails, cover letters, job applications, things that we take for granted, but that present legitimate barriers to refugee students on a daily basis. Through Revive, we partner with organizations that are embedded in the community to conduct needs assessments and develop culturally relevant curriculum. To date, we've had five workshops in over four different cities in the US and Turkey and are looking to expand to Lebanon in the spring. So this summer, I realized that individual change without institutional change is not simply enough. Refugee students could learn how to apply to colleges, but if colleges couldn't learn how to accept refugee students, then barriers like how someone could be fluent in five languages, but maybe only proficient in English, 
or requiring high school transcript from schools that have been destroyed by war present really serious barriers. They inhibit enrollment and discourage applicants. So moving forward through a partnership with the School of Social Work, I'm looking to address the application process itself to make it easier for refugee students to apply to college. Now, we skipped through a couple steps in our lesson, but you end the body of your email with your request and a conclusion. I urge you to share and learn what you have learned. I urge you to share what you learn with those who have not had the same opportunities as you and learn from their experiences as well. Because what I've learned through my work is that at the end of it all, we're sitting in this room sending emails for no other reason than circumstance and fate. And the students I work with through Revive deserve the same opportunities that we've received every bit as much as we do. So we should give them that chance. Thank you for listening, comma, Brooke Bossigal. And send. All right, this is one of our brief breaks again. <clears throat> but uh, back to geography. So I want to take a moment to uh, focus on our undergraduate students. Uh, and through the hard work of the Ford School uh, and generous donors, uh, at the undergraduate level, uh, we were able to support 37 students across a variety of sectors uh, on internships in summer 2019. And these undergrad internships were in five countries, seven different states, 10 different cities, and all policy sectors. So we checked all our boxes uh, when it came to nonprofit management, advocacy, local, state, federal government. And you'll hear from another undergrad here shortly. Uh, but getting to miles again, uh, and our reach again at the Ford School. So domestically at the undergrad level, the uh, furthest domestic internship was at a nonprofit in San Francisco, 2,358 miles from Ann Arbor. And the furthest international undergrad internship was in Kazakhstan, which is 5,811 miles from Ann Arbor. So we're gonna get to some more fun stuff here momentarily, <laughs> such as me passing it over to Herson. My name is Herson. I'm a second year MPP and I'm from Chicago. This summer I had the honor of working for Detroit Public Schools Community District, which is dedicated to serving all students in Detroit and I was assigned uh, to the Office of Government Affairs. My experience can be summed up by one of my favorite poems by Tupac Shakur. <laughs> and it goes like this. Did you hear about that rose that grew from the crack in the concrete? Proving nature's laws wrong, it learned to walk without having feet. Funny it seems, but by keeping its dreams, it learned to breathe fresh air. Long live the rose that grew from concrete when no one else ever cared. You see the students of Detroit, Chicago, and other struggling districts are roses. And yeah, we have bruised petals, but people need to learn to celebrate our tenacity and our willingness to grow. You see, at second grade, I needed an individualized education program, which meant I was a special ed kid. Since, schools, since my school lacked resources, there were times students like me didn't have enough, I didn't have a proper classroom to learn separately from the regular students. So we had to jump from the lunchroom, basement, and closets at times. But outside were other factors that played a role, like the local gangs, like the poverty, and violence in my neighborhood. But there, by the grace of God, a consistent work ethic, and a strong family foundation, I'm able to be here with you today. You see, I believe we can't separate politics from public education. The politics of compassion and decency is needed, and it is the least we can do for our future leaders. What happened throughout my primary education was political, and it should not be the norm. That is why I was so motivated to spearhead DPSCD's legislative agenda by helping launch their bill tracker using SharePoint. I had to compile all legislation introducing the education committees, which was well over 2,000 bills, so every department head can follow, and, um, follow the legislation that was related to their line of work. Additionally, I summarized bills that would directly impact Detroit's public education system. Uh, these, bill, these, these summaries were sent to my supervisor to keep her in the loop of all the, the specific bills necessary. I am proud to have worked for an institution that, like me, has overcome so much, despite critics calling it a failure. You see, it's not true that DPSCD mismanages funds. In fact, it's on its third consecutive year with a budget surplus. 
the number of fully staffed schools has increased from 22 to 44, and that's since 20, 2017. This year, DPSCD managed to decrease chronic absenteeism by 7%. It may not be much, but it's heading towards the right direction. Don't get it twisted. We don't want handouts or pity. Just stop pointing at our bruised petals. Instead, help celebrate our willingness to reach the sun. Before coming to Michigan, I was the assistant to the Illinois Deputy Governor and Chief Operating Officer, and I had some doubt that education policy was still my interest. But I am happy to have been relieved of that doubt after my experience in Detroit. Thank you. All right, let's welcome Aloka. Hi everyone, my name is Aloka Narayanan and I'm a second year MPP, originally from San Dimas, California. Some of my earliest and fondest memories come from the San Dimas Public Library, my local favorite place in my hometown. I have vivid recollections of walking in the seemingly gargantuan double doors, hand in my mother's, on my way to the next fantastical adventure. That is, whichever book I grabbed first. My mom, who is now retired, was a preschool teacher who worked part-time when I was a kid, while my dad worked full-time as an accountant. Mom was there to drop me off and pick me up from school every day, read, me, read to me every night, cook healthy meals for the family, and volunteer at my school whenever she got the chance. As a result of my parents' stable career and incomes, I enjoyed the privilege of a childhood oblivious to the threats of food insecurity and homelessness. My parents' continued investment of time, money, and attentiveness are the reasons that I'm here today. Most of De Detroit's children don't have the same opportunities that I did growing up due to simple truths of economic disinvestment. Some parents work two to three jobs a day with barely enough time to sleep, let alone take their kids to the library. 60% of Detroit children under five live in poverty and only 15% of children are reading proficiently by grade three. When I point to key reasons for why I'm here today, it all comes back to early childhood education and supports that I received. That's why I chose to spend my summer working on a citywide grade level reading campaign in Detroit. I worked with Brilliant Detroit, a remarkable nonprofit in the city that builds kids success neighborhoods where families and children are able to build steady, healthy, stable lives. The initiative I worked on is called 313 Reads and it boasts a systems level approach to ensure that more children are reading, by, reading proficiently by grade three. During my 10-week internship, I worked with Brilliant Detroit and Poverty Solutions at the University of Michigan to strengthen 313 Reads' collective impact model in three ways. First, I interviewed nonprofit directors in Detroit to assess capacity for expansion of early childhood services and possibilities to build stronger referral networks between them. Second, I researched leading practices used by grade level reading campaigns across the nation and education experts here at U of M to track progress on community-wide literacy goals. Finally, I built an evaluation framework informed by all of the above that would allow nonprofits and community leaders alike to see how well the city was doing at accomplishing all of those goals. I feel empowered every single day by the sincere efforts of my parents to build opportunity for me. The closest intervention to the comprehensive supports that I and others in my position have received is a collective impact model, which is essentially a comprehensive model for collaboration. 313 Reads involves partners from early education providers to pediatricians and food banks. Promising progress of other collective impact grade level reading campaigns gives me the inspiration to continue doing this work in Detroit. After graduation, I certainly will remain connected to the city and find new ways to contribute to the rise of new generations. Thank you. All right, get to hear from me briefly again. So at orientation, if you remember back a couple weeks, eh, three or so, I know so much has happened since then, uh, we asked our incoming MPPs a couple questions. If you recall being in our space, 34 to our tiny room, um, asking about your career aspirations uh, and interests. So one of those questions that we asked you, if you recall, is what will you do this semester to position yourself well to achieve your career-related goals? So I just want to let you know that we do read those. And I'm going to share a couple of responses with you right now. 
So number one, read the weekly emails. Thank you for doing that and showing up tonight. <laughs> uh, go to employer information sessions. Self-reflection. Start early to figure out what organizations I want to intern at. Go to programs. Again, coming here, check. Uh, try to develop relationships with faculty and alums who have experience in international policy. And I will challenge myself to develop stronger quantitative skills. I will push myself to ask for help. Attend as many info sessions, employer events as possible. So that's just a couple that we captured. Ah, uh, but we are ready to continue with our program. So, Pranav. Good evening. My name is Pranav Govindaraju, and I'm a senior here at the BA program at Ford. I came to Michigan from San Jose, California, where I grew up in the heart of Silicon Valley in a family of computer scientists and engineers. So as you can probably guess, I grew up with a passion for anything but computer science and engineering. <laughs> Instead, in high school, I focused my time on activities like debate, where I argued about things like the Dodd-Frank Act and the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and I was fascinated. You see, I wanted to learn how governments design regulations to account for things that are as unpredictable and as multivariate as the free market. It was a desire to answer questions like this that took me here to the Ford School and eventually led to me applying for an internship at the Federal Reserve. Now, just for some background on the Federal Reserve Board, or the Fed, the Fed is basically the central bank of the United States. It operates under a dual mandate from Congress to ensure long-term price stability and low levels of unemployment. Now, the Fed also has to maintain independence, and this just basically means that they don't check their Twitter. Now, I was hired to be a policy analytics intern in the Division of Supervision and Regulation. And as the name suggests, this was the body that was responsible for supervising and regulating financial institutions. And so basically, if any of the nation's banks were breaking the rules, it was our job to find out. Now, when I got to the Fed, I was tasked with a project to investigate atypical fluctuations in the derivative notional balances of systemically important financial institutions and to assess their purported effect on capital surcharge requirements. When I got there, I had no idea what those words meant. But essentially, I was being asked to assess whether or not some of the largest banks in the world were making their numbers look better than they actually were. And when I found out the gravity of this project, I was terrified. You see, not only was I being asked to assess the efficacy of a federal regulation, I didn't know how to use any of the statistical programming software they gave me, and I didn't even really know what a financial derivative was. So I was scared. But my apprehension soon gave way to excitement. You see, I was being asked to investigate some of the largest banks in the world. I felt like Steve Carell from The Big Short. <laughs> and as an intern, this felt like an incredible opportunity. And now by the end of my internship, I was asked to prevent to division supervisors and managers my findings. And so I gave an hour-long presentation with graphs, some numbers, and some more graphs uh, to basically answer the question, is anything going wrong with the banks? My answer was, I don't really know. There's not enough information. And that was okay. Because in the process of investigating, I learned more skills than I ever could have hoped for. I learned more about financial policy and about words that I previously didn't know the definitions of than I ever could have imagined. And I was even able to make recommendations on how the Federal Reserve Board can make changes to its existing capital surcharge criterion. Again, more words that I learned the definition of. And I felt like I was making a difference. And now, while I may not ever be able to see that impact materialize in the real world, while I can't tell you definitively that I made a positive impact this past summer, I can tell you that I learned. While I wasn't out there in the community, I was at a cubicle in front of a computer learning. I learned more than I ever could have imagined. And I like to believe that in the realm of public policy, that's the first step. Now, I don't know what my second step is going to be. I know I want to continue working with economic policy, but I don't know whether that's going to be in the government or in the private sector. But what I do know is that with my experiences at the Fed, I'm ready to learn more. I'm ready to face the greater challenges. And that's exciting to me. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, let's welcome Brandon. Good evening. 
My name is Brandon Pierce. I'm a second year MPP student here at the Ford School studying education policy and analysis methods. Uh, beginning my, uh, my internship, internship search, knowing that I wanted to be in education policy, but really open to what that looked like. Um, I'd come from the nonprofit sector, a pretty small nonprofit, and so I was hoping to go someplace bigger, either district or state level. Um, my search became a little more uh, focused when my partner, who had been getting her MBA in Baltimore all year, uh, got an internship in Boston. Um, and so I didn't know anyone in Boston, so I immediately talked to Peter, and Peter was able to connect me with a couple of alumni, and before I knew it, the chief of staff at BPS was sending all my contact information out to all the directors uh, at central office. And so within a couple of weeks, I had secured uh, a summer internship. Um, and so when I was at BPS, I worked on the team of recruitment, cultivation, and diversity. And so this is a team of about 10 that implements and designs programs to recruit, retain, and develop educators of color in the district. And this idea is, is to enough research that proves that students of color do better uh, when they have teachers that reflect their ethnicity. Um, and students of color make up about 60% of Boston Public Schools, um, and the teachers are roughly 80% white. Um, so these programs are actually the same programs that I wrote about in my public policy 510 paper and was like super excited about like, what would that look like in Detroit? Um, and so these like fellowship opportunities, um, networking events, ways for people that have been underrepresented in traditional uh, teacher preparation programs to get access and become teachers at the district. Um, so as an intern, I did a lot of capacity building at the district. Um, I was able to flex a lot of the skills that I'd learned in my first year here at Ford. Um, did some uh, strategy memos around um, recruiting different demographics. Um, I designed a data tracking tool using Excel, and I can now really say that I'm like proficient in Excel on my resume. Um, <laughs> And, and that is going to be continued to be uh, used for many programs. Um, I did some program evaluation on different recruitment events. Um, I even downloaded Stata onto my computer. Um, and I'd have it open and my team members would walk by and be like, oh my God, what are they making you do? And I was like, no, 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 I like this. This is fun to me. <laughs> Um, and so I was able to look at how effective this pre-screening process was at identifying high quality candidates of color um, and getting them into the, the pipeline faster. And I was able to show that, that it was making a, a significant impact there. Um, and my team was really wonderful. I got to connect on many different issues. So I looked at um, the new union agreement that had just gotten um, ratified. Um, there was a new superintendent and had a transition team coming in. Um, I got to learn all about the budgeting process that was about to get started. Um, but there's one conversation that I had that really sort of like was my turning point of the summer. And that was with my director talking about sort of where the progress of these recruitment efforts have been over the last several years. And, and she mentioned that a couple of years ago, um, they had hired 100% of the African American graduates at the Harvard School of Education. That was one student. Um, and so it, it really, spoke to me like th these, these programs are so important, um, but they can't have the impact that they need to have just at the district level. Um, and if it's difficult for Boston Public Schools, which is an incredibly well-resourced large urban district that pays their teachers six figures and you get uh, tenure after your fourth year teaching, what chance does a district like Detroit have? Um, a Detroit where you know recruiting teachers of color isn't the biggest issue is recruiting anyone to come fill a teacher vacancy in the, in the building. Um, so my experience this summer really reinforced that the policies I'm interested in are more at the state level, and that's where I um, uh, plan to continue my journey in the years ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to deliver a pitch, too. Uh, just kidding on that one. But I am going to share some more feedback from our uh, incoming MPPs. So one more question that we asked at orientation. How do you want to use your degree in future endeavors and opportunities? And here is some of your feedback. So being able to use data to promote global social justice, 
Having worked on the ground in my field and seen the problems, I want to use my degree to affect real change on a wider level than the individual, gain policy and analysis skills to inform partnership development between the public and private sectors, promote economic security and opportunity in Detroit, poverty alleviation, gender equality, and running for office, travel the world, provide for my family and my dogs, and serve the public good. Avril, come on down. Thank you, I'll sign autographs later. <laughs> All righty. Sending reports to CEO Mary Barra, driving autonomous vehicles in the proving ground, having meetings on a boat, my name is Avril Prakash, and these are just some of the highlights from my summer at General Motors in Detroit. So my goal at the Ford School was to specialize in the regulation of emerging tech. I wanted to create economic and political infrastructure that allows regulation to keep up with the fast pace of innovation that spurs growth. And here at Ford, I used the STPP certificate to explore the policy landscape of emerging technologies like autonomous vehicles because mobility impacts every aspect of your life, from the individual to the community, work, family, quality of life. So you might have heard of GM. Um, they're the largest automaker in the US. They produce vehicles in 37 countries. And their uh, branding lineup includes uh, Buick, Cadillac, Chevrolet, and GMC. So GM envisions a future of zero crashes, zero emissions, and zero congestion. And they're committed to an all electric future. And they're actually the first American automaker to mass produce an affordable electric car. So it's long been a dream of mine to work for an American automaker because the big three are such an integral part of what makes Michigan, Michigan. And this role gave me a behind the scenes understanding of why. So while environmental policy is not my career focus, um, the path to vehicle electrification rests on emerging technology and that experience allowed me to explore this policy area that's in my interest. So based out of the Renaissance Center in Detroit, I was an intern for the global public policy team and uh, I worked on the energy and environment portfolio. So over the course of my internship, I basically helped um, GM's strategic planning process by uh, addressing global regulatory changes. Uh, some key regulations at the heart of my team's work included federal fuel economy and greenhouse gas emission standards. So over my 12 weeks, I had examined California's greenhouse gas emissions uh, modeling to clarify their assumptions. I had analyzed federal fuel economy data to isolate market trends. I also had to evaluate California's bifurcation or split from federal rulemaking. You might hear about that tomorrow in the news. Um, and I also had to monitor uh, presidential candidates' policy that affected GM's portfolio. So this role allowed me to put my graduate studies in emerging tech regulation to practical use. The Ford School emphasis on quantitative research and uh, analysis allowed me to deliver impactful reports directly to CEO Mary Barra and the rest of the senior leadership team with confidence. My internship included several aspects unique to the policy team. I discovered a new legal strategy that gave GM a competitive advantage. I also got to test drive their autonomous vehicles. These would not have been possible on any other team within GM because global public policy is able to have touch points on such nascent issues that just aren't possible on business development or on the legal team, for instance. And we had our bi-monthly meetings on a colleague's boat. I guess that was fun. Um, the experience confirmed my goal to pivot into the private sector, and it really opened my eyes to the multitude of opportunities and innovation that's present in the auto industry. I really believe that combining business acumen with my passion for public policy can help me promote the constant innovation and stay true to my personal values and ethics of uh, being, ensuring equal access to opportunity in the digital age. So thank you so much. John. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is John Martinez, and I am here today partly due to luck and mostly due to a hardworking, determined mother who wanted to provide a better life for her children than the one that she had. My family was able to do the impossible, break the vicious cycle of poverty, which we, like countless others, have faced for generations. My roots inform my devotion to the alleviation of poverty, 
an issue that is driven by a multitude of factors which I am prepared to do my part in addressing throughout my life. Before coming to Ford, I focused on uh, mitigating health disparities in the city of Detroit related to lead poisoning and asthma. The number of roadblocks faced by families inspired me to come here. This past summer, I had the privilege to work for my community once again uh, by interning for the Detroit Mayor's Office, whose mission is to serve the, the residents of the city. There I work for the Lean Team, who focuses on supporting city managers, increasing the impact of their programs through the use of such tools as the DMAIC framework, which is a data-driven improvement cycle that stands for define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. We work on many issues, ranging from simplifying procurement to improving emergency service deployment. Essentially, it's the mayor's consulting team, but saying the word consultant in the city is like saying Voldemort at Hogwarts. <laughs> you don't want to do that. <laughs> Through the Lean Team, I had the opportunity of working on one of the mayor's policy priorities, supporting a workforce development pilot titled Detroit Job Brightness Event. This pilot streamlined various services to bust barriers to employment, such as expungement, tutoring, and GED attainment into one bundle. This was made possible with an agreement with Fiat Chrysler to provide Detroiters who participate in the program priority hiring for their new G plant that opens next year. I had a key role in crafting, training staff, and implementing this pilot throughout, this, throughout the summer. By the end, we were able to serve over 9,000 Detroit residents through the program. During exit interviews, hope radiated from the face of these residents. Many of them told me that this was the first time in their lives that they felt that the city was working for them. Moments like this fuel my drive to serve and help those in need. As we speak, thousands of Detroiters are applying for those jobs available to them thanks to the pilot, which the city plans to expand and continue and hopefully serve as a framework for others to use. My fingers are crossed that when the smoke clears and the G plant opens its doors next year, thousands of Detroiters will be given the opportunity to break the cycle of poverty. My experience this summer reinforced the vision I came here to pursue and reminded me the importance of working with a great team and a passionate mentor. Also to my surprise, the dynamic nature of consulting might be what's right for me. I know this won't be the last time that I play a role in working to improve the lives of those in my community, thanks to the doors that Ford has opened to me. Thank you. All right. Can we have all our presenters please stand? And can we give them one more round of applause? <laughs> well, thank you everyone uh, for coming out, supporting your fellow peers here at the Ford School. It was a very incredible evening that is continuing. So, what we are doing is we're gonna ask everyone to clear the room and start the reception in the doors behind you. So if we could have our presenters head out there. Once the room is cleared, our judges will deliberate and we will announce right outside in five minutes.